Great, that looks like everyone's joined. Um, Auntie, shall we begin? Hi everyone, um, my name is Michelle. I'm the Marketing Specialist at Optimum Solutions. Um, I'll be handing over to Auntie, who will be taking us through today's presentation. Great, thank you, Michelle. So uh, good day, everyone, and welcome to this session about uh, revolutionizing industrial fault detection with AI and machine learning. Uh, my name is Antti Ledre and I'm a senior application engineer at MathWorks. Uh, I'm based in our office in Finland. And uh, um, as an application engineer at MathWorks, my job is to basically guide and help our uh, customers use MATLAB for different things. Uh, and I'm especially focusing on MATLAB applications, so uh, I work a lot with AI, predictive maintenance and also application deployment. And uh, today's topic is, is uh, very much uh, an AI related topic. So uh, yeah, we'll be looking at how to detect anomalies and how to uh, also identify different kinds of faults in machinery. Okay, um, so why do industrial companies use AI? So obviously there's lots of use cases for AI in, in different industries. Um, but here, here are kind of maybe three main buckets. Um, so one use case is to monitor the processes and, for example, detect anomalies in the process so that you can do or take preventive action and maybe uh, control the process in a different way um, so that you don't get any anomalies. Uh, you can also improve the quality, uh, for example, by, you know, diagnosing defects um, on the production line. Uh, so basically looking for some kind of uh, manufacturing faults in the products that or products or goods that you're manufacturing. And then uh, optimizing the maintenance schedule. So this is um, related to predictive maintenance. So uh, quite often you, you also want to identify faults or anomalies in the machinery that you're operating and maybe even predict that, okay, what type of fault is that? And um, you could also try to predict, for example, the remaining useful life for the for the machinery that you're operating. And this obviously saves a lot of money because you can um, decrease the, the downtime and, and so on. And today we'll be looking at uh, anomaly detection uh, in, in industrial processes and also um, identifying faults in machinery. And here's the brief agenda for, for the presentation. So we, I, I have two demos for anomaly detection and the fault identification. And then um, I'll also briefly discuss how you can operationalize uh, applications and algorithms that you develop in MATLAB. And at the end, um, uh, we should have time for some Q&A as well. OK, so let's start with the anomaly detection. So um, what do we mean by anomalies? Uh, well, there are many types of anomalies and kind of the easiest anomaly to spot and identify are kind of point anomalies that somehow stand out from the uh, rest of the data. So these could be easily spotted, you know, just by looking at the data. Uh, but then you can also have uh, something called collective anomalies, which typically occur across um, many signals. So it could be just a some kind of an unexpected combination of, of uh, sensor values or something like that. So not necessarily something that clearly stands out from the data. And then you could also have visual anomalies, which basically mean that, you know, you have images of, for example, products that you're manufacturing, and then uh, you have some kind of defects in the images, you know, defects in the products, and that can be seen in the images. And, you know, the point of anomaly detection is basically try to, you know, find out if there's something different happening in the process or in the machinery or, or whatever. And it can be very difficult to identify anomalies um, in the data. So here I have two examples of um, uh, similar sensor data, and the other one actually has some anomalies, but it's really difficult to see that, okay, which one of these um, samples actually have those anomalies. So what you might need to do is to actually transform the data uh, somehow so that you can better identify those anomalies. And for example, if you have data like vibration data, uh, quite often you do frequency analysis. So if you convert these time domain data into frequency domain and you can identify the, the fundamental frequencies in the data, 
we actually see some differences here. So in this case, actually the, the blue, uh, sorry, the black data is the one with anomaly. And we see that this center uh, frequency peak has kind of shifted uh, towards the lower frequencies. So, um, you know, identifying the, the locations of these peaks and maybe the heights of the peaks, um, you know, we could use that as a feature to discriminate or differentiate between a normal sample or and anomalous sample. Um, but even this might not be enough if you have, for example, multiple sensor data like, like we do here. So here we have uh, vibration data in X, Y, and Z directions, and we have two samples here, and the other one has anomalies. So what you might then need to do is that you, you might have to extract multiple features, and then you look at the distribution of multiple features. So not just like a location of the fre frequency peak, but you might actually extract um, all different kinds of uh, features uh, in time domain, in frequency domain, and so on. And then you could maybe uh, train some kind of model or method to um, identify anomalies in this type of data. And this is what we'll, we'll be looking at in the second example, which is about fault identification. Now, you may not always even know what an anomaly looks like. Uh, and that's because, you know, machinery and processes, they, they typically, you know, run in a normal fashion. So you might not have um, data collected where you actually have anomalies. Uh, so you can't really train maybe something like supervised machine learning models um, because you have so few uh, samples of anomalies. Um, the solution to this is that you can actually train some unsupervised uh, machine learning models that only require normal data. So, and this is quite popular nowadays because, you know, exactly for the, because of this reason that companies don't have a lot of failure data or data that has anomalies. So you train a model uh, only with normal data. It could be something which is based on distributions. So basically the model learns that, okay, what is normal? And then anything that falls outside of that normal model um, is considered as an anomaly. Uh, but here, even in this approach, you, you have to define that what's normal. And that can be a surprisingly difficult problem. So many companies, they actually spend a lot of time developing something called like a golden reference, uh, which represents normal operation. But it's really up to you to kind of define that what is normal and then uh, train or develop the model using that data. And even if you have a fairly good model and you can kind of use the model to identify outliers or anomalies, um, those anomalies might not be actual problems in the process or in the machinery. So you might actually have to do some fine tuning. So that's quite common. And there are lots of different methods to um, detect anomalies. So you can start with some very simple statistics based models. Uh, you could use signal change point detection, or you could use control charts um, and so on. Uh, but then you can also use uh, both supervised and unsupervised machine learning. So supervised machine learning means that you're developing a predictive model that can tell you uh, that uh, is this sample normal or is it abnormal? But as I mentioned, this might be difficult to develop because uh, you might not have enough um, abnormal data to train these type of models. So that's why you use um, unsupervised techniques quite often. And this is where you can use, you know, different types of multivariate statistical models. You could use autoencoders, which are based on neural networks. Um, and you could use uh, one class SVMs and so on. Right. Um, so yeah, let's hop on to the first demo, which is um, about detecting anomalies in an industrial pro process, namely um, electrolytical copper production process. So the data that we'll be working with is uh, basically uh, measurement data. Uh, so we, uh, we have measured um, different types of impurities in, in copper. So basically the amount of uh, silver, nickel, lead, and, and so on. So different metals um, 
in the copper. So these are considered as impurities. And we have one year worth of data and we've taken two measurements each day. So we have something like um, 750 samples of data. And the goal in this example is to just uh, apply a few different um, methods to try to identify these uh, kind of like anomalies, these uh, impurities that somehow stand out from the data um, in a statistical way, basically. Uh, so basically, I, I just want to highlight a few techniques available in MATLAB that you can use uh, to detect anomalies in, in the data and uh, basically showing that, okay, you can use many different uh, techniques to compare these methods and then maybe uh, take the method that seems seems most feasible. So at this point, let me hop over to MATLAB. And I'm going to run this example from a script. Um, so here I have um, something called a live script in MATLAB. So we, we have some text in the script and we have the table of the con table of contents. Um, and then I have also divided this uh, script into sections of code. So obviously uh, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to access data. And I actually have the data just uh, sitting in a mat file. So I can go ahead and load that file. And inside the file we had uh, four different variables. We have actually the impurities. So we have eight different measurements uh, for the different metals. Uh, and we have the names for those. Um, and then we have also something called TAI. So this is uh, a variable called um, total analysis index, um, which apparently um, means it, it's some kind of like a weighted um, combination of these different impurities. Uh, and it was used by the curator of this data set to uh, kind of provide some kind of ground truth or like a metric that they use to actually identify anomalies and you know levels of impurities that are unacceptable right um but let's go ahead and look at the data so actually create a table out of that um, um, data so i'm using the array to table method here to create a table and then um I can use something called a stacked plot uh, to visualize all these different impurities all at once. So let's see, actually, maybe I have to, yeah, let me do this because it's behaving in a weird way. So there's a lot of lag in, in actually using this. So let me do this again. <clears throat> so let's create the stacked plot. Now it looks better. So let me pop up, pop out that uh, plot. And now we actually see all these impurities uh, um, in the same plot. And uh, here, for example, we have the um, silver. Here we have the nickel, uh, lead, and so on. And we have eight of these impurities. And we see that there are clear spikes here and there. Uh, for example, here we have a large spike in the silver but then uh, we don't really have a clear spike in some of the other impurities uh, but then for example here we do see that there's a spike across all of these signals so you know some of these anomalies are quite uh, quite obvious in the data but let's use some uh, statistical methods to actually identify these um, anomalies but maybe first we want to also look at the uh, distribution of the values in, in all of these uh, measurements. So I can do that by using something called a box plot. Uh, so box plot um, in a very quick way allows me to look into the distribution of the data. Uh, and a box plot looks like this. So basically this red horizontal line means that's the median value. Um, and then we have the edges of the box. These are the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And then uh, these whiskers over here, these black whiskers, these are uh, basically the uh, kind of the limits, upper and lower limits of the data, which are not con considered as outliers. And the outliers are um, shown with these uh, red plus signs. Um, so we see that each and every, at least the box plot, it uses a certain kind of uh, 
method to identify the outliers. Uh, I think it's something like uh, 2.7 standard errors away from the median or, or the mean value. Um, but we can we can look at the distribution. We see that you know, for example, this one has a very tight distribution, so not a lot of variance there, uh, whereas uh, the silver has a lot more variance. Uh, but these uh, quantities, they have different scales, so it actually might make sense to actually um, standardize or normalize these measurements. So I can do that easily with a normalized function here. Uh, and then create another box plot. And then we actually see that the scale has uh, changed. So now basically uh, the mean value is zero and uh, the variance is one uh, across all of these measurements. Right. Uh, but this, you know, this could be one way to kind of identify outliers, but we might actually want to use some more advanced method as well. Now, something that has been quite, uh, you know, historically used a lot is uh, control charts. Um, so you can also um, create control, control charts in MATLAB. Uh, so I could maybe just look at the silver content and I could also uh, pre-process the data a bit so I could use something like a mean averaging across the data to kind of, you know, filter out a little bit of that noise that might be in the, in the data and kind of focus on the main trends. Um, so let's, let's do that. So control charts basically, uh, you know, the main thing in, in control charts is that you have like a lower and upper uh, control limit. So uh, any any data point that is either below or above the control limits are, are kind of considered out of control um, samples, which might be indications of anomalies. So uh, here, um, these upper and lower bounds, they're basically defined as, uh, you know, they're three standard errors away from the mean, mean value. And we see that, you know, there's definitely a lot of samples which are um, out of control. Now this was just for the um, silver, so we could also apply this to the entire data set. So we could just run a for loop and compute the control chart for all of these um, impurity values. And let me once again pop this figure out. Um, and now we can see that, you know, you know, every measurement basically has these out of control points. Uh, but then the question is that, okay, which or what constitutes as an anomaly? Is it an anomaly when, you know, all of these signals are at a specific time out of control? For example, here we see that at this uh, point in time, these signals, they seem to have these out of control points. But then over here, um, it's not really in the lead uh, impurity. It's it's not out of control. It's not above the uh, control limits. So is 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 it an anomaly when one of these is out of control, or do they all need to be out of control? So that's might be difficult to kind of define. So that's why we might want to use something more advanced like um, uh, machine learning. So let's go ahead and apply a couple of different machine learning methods uh, for anomaly detection. Uh, so the first technique that I'll use is something called one class SVM. So this basically means that we're creating a support vector machine um, only with normal samples, like one class uh, only. And that basically creates an anomaly detection model. Uh, so I can do that by using the fit C SVM function, uh, pass in my data, and the response that we're trying to predict here, normally we would actually have, in a supervised uh, machine learning case, we would have some kind of response that might have some variance. We would have, you know, the class samples here, but because we're training a one class SVM, we just the response is basically just a vector of ones. That's all. So no variance at all. Um, and we do want to standardize the data to kind of make the, all the measurements uh, to the same scale. And what we also need to provide is the outlier fraction, which basically means that 
um, it means the expected number of anomalies in the data. And here we specify that as 2%. So we expect that 2% of the uh, samples are actually anomalies. Now the question is, how do you come up with this number? Well, we came up with this number uh, through trial and error. Uh, but if you're actually operating some kind of process, you might have some historical data and knowledge about the frequency of the an anomalies. So you would use that. Um, but this number, you know, it could be something that you have to tune uh, during the process and during the operations. Uh, but basically, once we have trained the model with our data, we can make some predictions. And in this case, we're actually using the same data to train our model. And then we're trying to identify the uh, anomalies in the training data. So that's something that you can do. But ideally, you would actually have, um, you know, the training data would be just normal data with no anomalies. And then uh, hopefully you have then some test data where maybe most of the samples are normal and then you have some anomalies uh, in the data. But in our case, we don't have that kind of data. So we're actually just trying to identify the anomalies in the training data. So let's run that and we actually can then uh, find out that, okay, which of the samples are uh, anomalies. So basically the predict function gives an anomaly score for each of the data samples that we have and everything Every sample that has a score value below zero, that's categorized as an anomaly. Okay, and then we can uh, visualize. So we can just uh, do a quick visualization of the data with the anomalies uh, in the data. So we can have a look at, uh, let's say, four first of the impurities. And then with the red circles, we uh, mark those samples that have been identified as anomalies by the one class SVN. And we do see that, for example, this peak has been identified as an anomaly. But then, for example, here, uh, the one class SVM, it doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't consider these as an anomaly. And it could be because this uh, lead uh, data, it doesn't really have any kind of spike in there. So that might be the reason to that. Uh, but in any way, any case, machine learning models, they can kind of capture the variance in the data, even if it's multidimensional data like we do have here. Um, and they are kind of good at finding uh, the anomalies in this case. So um, you shouldn't be surprised that, you know, even if it seems like an obvious outlier, you know, the machine learning model can kind of um, identify and reason that. Okay, um, so that was one class SVM. And as in, in a similar fashion, um, there are other models, other anomaly detection models that you can train. Um, and the training procedure is very similar. And something that we quite recently added into MATLAB uh, is something called isolation forest. So we added that in uh, 2021 B version of MATLAB. And again, it's very simple to use. Uh, so you just call the iForest function, you pass the data. And similarly to the one class SVM, you have to provide, in this case, it's called contamination fraction. Uh, but it's basically the same uh, number that we used with the one class SVM. So it's the expected uh, fraction of anomalies in the data. And maybe I can go back to the slides and explain how the isolation forest actually works. So uh, the isolation forest, it is based on something called a decision tree. So decision tree basically uh, finds these decision boundaries or cuts in the data. Um, and then these cuts are basically these nodes in your tree structure. And if it's, for example, below the certain value, you go to the left. And if it's, uh, if the sample is above the, the cutoff point, then you go to the right. And basically isolation forest, they kind of randomly divide the data set into these different cuts and then uh, formulate this decision tree or actually like a forest of decision trees because you have many. And then uh, because anomalies, they, they kind of somehow, they're separate from the rest of the data. Um, it's, it's, they're kind of, in a way, using this technique, they're easy to find. So you kind of make the first cut and you know with just one single decision, you can actually identify that uh, anomaly. So typically anomalies are 
ones that appear highest in the decision tree, so they have the highest anomaly score. Yeah, so yeah, that was that was my kind of attempt to explain how these isolation forests work. Um, but you can read more about uh, about the isolation forest in the documentation if you want. Right, so let's let's call that function. Um, and again, it's very quick. Um, and it actually, the isolation force, it has this method called east anomaly, so you can directly identify the anomaly, so you don't have to compute any score values or, or such. But now we have basically tried a couple of different methods. So we used the control chart, we used uh, the um, one class SVM, and then we tried isolation forest. So let's go ahead and compare these methods. So uh, here we have a lot of code. Um, it's actually just for visual visualization. So we just, you know, plot um, different data, kind of the results from the different anomaly detection methods. And we generate this plot where we can compare all these different methods. So at the top, we have the one class SVM and that only identifies. So we are actually looking at one specific portion of the impurities. And the one class um, SVM ident identifies one anomaly. Uh, the isolation forest uh, identifies two anomalies, uh, this one right here. And the control chart actually finds much more anomalies, even you know samples that are quite small um, with their value. That's probably because it was kind of below the lower um, control limit. Um, and then at the bottom, we have the total analysis index, which again is a metric which was computed by the curator of this data set. So this was actually uh, curated by a mining company. Um, and they apparently, when I was searching for, for more information about this data set, apparently they use the value eight as a threshold. So if the total analysis index is above eight, uh, they consider that sample as too impure. Uh, so that's you know would would be a sample that they discard, and it looks like so. These two samples are about that threshold, and you know the isolation forest seems to be able to identify those samples. Right. So basically, when you create anomaly detection method, it's probably a good idea. To Good idea to compare different methods and then kind of pick the one that seems to give you the most most accurate results. And again, you might have to tune uh, the algorithm while it's actually in operation. All right, so that was the first example. So let me actually go back to the slides and have a quick summary. So we used a couple, a few different up um, detection methods. So we used control charts. We used uh, a couple of different different super uh, unsupervised methods, but you could also use uh, supervised machine learning if you have plenty of um, anomaly data. It's usually a good idea to compare different methods, um, but it might be difficult to actually you know define that what it, what's normal because um, even some kind of anomalies or outliers they might actually be in a way normal. So yeah, companies spend quite a lot of time to actually creating data sets that they consider normal. OK, so that was anomaly detection. So let's move on to the second example, which is about um, identifying different types of faults in machinery. And in this case, we're, we're looking at a rock drill. Um, and we have collected um, uh, pressure data from three different locations in a rock drill, experiencing 11 different uh, types of failures. And basically what we want to do here is that we want to explore again different types of features that help us di uh, differentiate these different types of uh, failure modes. And we want to also train um, or explore different types of classifiers which could predict uh, the type of failure when we get new data from the rock drill, pressure data. Um, and the data it's basically you know pressure data sample at 50 kilohertz. Um, and this data was actually used in a, in a data challenge or a competition. Um, and, and this demo that I, I'll be showing, um, it, it was actually my solution to this uh, data challenge. Uh, and I think I got some pretty good results. But there are two points in this demo. We want to explore different types of features. So feature engineering, 
So transforming the data into um, descriptive features um, and then training a machine learning model, basically a classifier to detect uh, and identify these different types of failure modes. So let me hop over to that example. Just clean the workspace a bit. It's this one and then open a new script. And again, I'll run this um, example from a script. Now, again, the first thing that we need to do is to access the data. Uh, and I'm using some, something called a data store to access uh, the data. And the data I actually have here, so it's basically uh, just CSV files. Um, so we have several um, files. Um, and basically, each file represents a different unit of a rock drill. And then this identifier like PDMP, that means one of the locations for the pressure sensor. And then we have PIN and then we have PO. So these are the two other uh, measurement locations in the rock drill. And I'm basically importing these files into their own separate um, objects and then just using read all to basically import these all of these files at once um, into a table. So then I have three different tables, PDM data, PIN data, and PO data. And then eventually I'll put all of those into a single table. And if I just execute this section, uh, we can see what the table looks like. So here I then have um, pressure data from this location, uh, the other location, and the third location, and all these, all these different uh, observations. And in the fourth column, I actually have the uh, fault mode. Uh, so the associated fault mode for each of these uh, recordings of data. So this is the type of data that we need to have when we develop supervised machine learning models. So we need to have our input data, which in this case is the sensor data. And then we need to have uh, samples of the associated output, in this case, the class label for the uh, for the failure. So then we can train a machine learning model that can hopefully uh, map unknown sensor data into an estimation of the fault or fault class. All right. So then what we need to do, uh, well, I could, for example, let's have a look at uh, one of these data. So let's uh, open the data in the variable editor in MATLAB and have a look at one of these pressure signals. So I can just do a quick plot and this is what it looks like. Um, and if we look at the other measurement location, yeah, it might look a bit different, but again, it's difficult to see that, okay, what are the characteristics in each of these raw data that would help us differentiate these different types of failure modes? And for that, we need to extract features and potentially a lot of features. And to help with that task, uh, we have uh, in our predictive maintenance toolbox, we have some, something called a diagnostic feature designer app. So you can find it in the apps tab. If you go to the uh, control system design and analysis, there we have the diagnostic feature designer. And again, it's part of the uh, predictive maintenance toolbox. Uh, but I can all, also launch it by using this uh, diagnostic feature designer command. And this is an in interactive environment that allows me to, in a very quick fashion, uh, extract lots of features, uh, features that are commonly used for predictive maintenance applications, in this case, diagnostics or uh, fault identification. So I can just uh, click a new session and I can choose my variable, which is now the data table. And I see the contents of the data table. Uh, so we have the PDMP, PIN and PO, those are the pressure signals. And then we also have the fault column there. And then I can just go ahead and import this data into the app. And on the left-hand side, we, we see these different um, pressure signals. I can highlight one of these. And then I could, for example, uh, visualize um, all of these pressure signals. So in our case, we actually have uh, 500 recordings of the pressure signals. So here we can visualize those pressure signals from that one specific location. 
And obviously it's a very messy plot because, because we're plotting all of these on top of each other. Uh, but because we do have the fault information also in our data set, we could, um, uh, we could actually um, group these pressure signals by the fault. So here I could, uh, for example, uh, click the fault number seven, and I can highlight um, those pressure signals which are associated with the fault number seven. And then maybe use the four, and that highlights uh, a different group of signals. And we can kind of already see that, okay, there are definitely some differences in the pressure signals between these, di between these different failure modes. So by looking at these signals in, in this way, we could already, you know, maybe get an idea that, okay, what kind of features should, should I be using uh, when I want to create a model that can differentiate these uh, fault modes? So maybe using something like peak-to-peak -peak values, if there are some differences in amplitudes or things like that. But from here, it, it's not actually obvious. So let's go ahead and just extract features and then later find out that, okay, what are the useful features? Uh, so from here, I could, for example, compute uh, time domain features or signal features uh, from one of these pressure signals. And when I click that, I actually get these um, different. So these are the different features that you can compute. Uh, so you can check out you know, or uncheck some of these boxes if you don't want to compute some of the features. Uh, but I could actually just you know, compute all these signal features and then MATLAB will then uh, automatically compute uh, all these 13 or so features for all of these 500 uh, signals. So let's just uh, allow MATLAB to, MATLAB to uh, finish the computations. And unfortunately, always in teams, uh, the computations are much slower. I don't know, maybe it's because the teams is using a lot of CPU power. Uh, but yeah, I think it's soon finished. So actually, without doing any kind of programming, we can compute features like you know, RMS values, standard deviations, then some higher level features like kurtosis or skewness, which uh, basically look at the distribution uh, of the samples and so on. So. Yeah, th this is kind of the whole point in this tool that you don't have to do uh, manual programming. And then in the end, we actually get histograms of these different uh, features, um, and we also and these histograms are grouped by the uh, fault codes. Right. Um, in the interest of time, let me actually go back and load a session. So what you could do is that you can also you know, estimate the spectrum for from these time domain signals. And once you have done that, you can then go ahead and uh, extract frequency based uh, free features as well. And also time frequency based. So things like uh, extracting features from spectrograms. Um, and then if you're kind of lazy and you don't want to even do this clicking, what you can do is that you can uh, compute all the features that can be computed with this tool. And that will actually extract something like a hundred different features uh, from each of the signals. And I have actually done that before. So let me go ahead and um, open a session where I have uh, saved all these pre-computed features because computing all of these, you know, in this case, 261 features from th uh, for all these uh, three different pressure signals, that takes a bit of time. So yeah, I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to load a pre-saved session. Um, and the data contained um, in that session, it's actually quite hefty, so it might take a few seconds for the app to open. <clears throat> All right. So let me actually close this. So here on the left hand side, we actually see that we have the original signals, but then we also have some intermediate data we, which was computed um, to be able to compute some other features. But in the end, we actually have the feature table and we now see that it has a lot of different features. So it's 260 uh, and something uh, features in total. 
So do we want to train a model with all of those features? Probably not. So let me go back to the slides. Um, so basically the whole point of feature extraction is that you kind of want to create these nicely separable um, clusters uh, using those features so that the machine learning model can you know, define some kind of decision boundaries. So whenever we get a, a new data point or a sample from the sensors, we can then hopefully in a robust manner um, and in an accurate manner, we can assign a fault class um, to that data point. And if you have good features, um, this should be fairly easy for the machine learning model to do. But if you have bad features, features that don't allow you to separate these different failure classes, it's going to be difficult to assign the right class for the unknown sample. Uh, so basically, in this case, it could be just you know flipping a coin. Uh, so the, basically, the machine learning model is almost like guessing the fault class if you have poor features. Right, so what we want to do is that we want to rank all of these features and maybe use only the features that help really help us differentiate these failure classes. And we can do that by using something called feature ranking. So here I have a button to do that. So I can just rank these some of these features. And we, we see this visual plot, uh, like a bar diagram for the different features. And the wider the bar, the better the feature is. Uh, and we use uh, analysis of variance as the ranking method. So basically uh, computing that, okay, how much of the variance in the original data does this uh, feature explain? And here we also have the score values. So all in all, we had uh, almost 300 uh, features, but what I could do is that maybe I take only top 20 features and then train the, the model with those 20 features only. So let's go ahead and go ahead and do that. So I can actually go ahead and export these features uh, to a model training app. So I can say that, okay, I want to use top 20 features to train my machine learning model. So let's export those features into another tool called classification learner. So one of the big challenges in machine learning is that there are dozens of different types of models and algorithms for machine learning uh, classification in this case. So how do you find the best model? And this is exactly what this tool solves. So you can, in a very quick fashion, you can identify the best performing model. Um, so we just need to make sure that we have the data set right here. So we have the feature table as our input data, and we're trying to predict the fault. So that seems to be right. And then we can choose our validation scheme. Uh, so we can use cross validation or holdout validation. Let's just use the holdout validation and then start a session. And then <clears throat> we can already see uh, these different features. Um, uh, visualized as a scatter plot and from here I can choose the feature that I imported into this app and if I would see you know clusters here um, it would mean that you know these particular features that I selected here uh, are maybe able to separate these classes so here for example let's do like this it seems that the class number two it's quite well separable by using this median feature and the damping factor feature uh, but we have actually 20 different features, so it's difficult to visualize those all at once. So we can only pick two, two at a time. But the machine learning models, they can actually work with n-dimensional data. So yeah, we don't have to worry about that too much. Um, and the interesting part in this app is actually here. So in this drop-down menu, we have um, a few dozen popular machine learning models for classification. So we have different types, types of ensembles. Uh, we have nearest neighbor based classifiers, we have support vector machines and so on. And I could actually go ahead and train all of these models at once with the same features and then very quickly identify that what is the best model for this particular problem. And I can also use parallel computing uh, to speed up this process. So basically training multiple models uh, uh, at the same time on the different CPU cores on, on my laptop. And here we see uh, the model training uh, progressing, and we see basically the, uh, 
uh, model accuracy. So, so far this linear discriminant um, model seems to be the best one with 87% accuracy. And we still have a few models to train, but I think that linear discriminant model is probably, probably the winner here. And we can further examine the accuracy of the model by using, uh, for example, confusion matrix. So we can look at the accuracy class by class in this case. So we can see that, for example, this class number six, we're 100% accurate. Uh, same with class number nine, uh, three and four. But we're, we have some problems in, uh, with class uh, uh, seven in this case. So in 45% of the observations for class number seven, in 45% of the cases, we actually mix that up with a class number eight. So we might actually go back and try some other features uh, and, and so on. So this is typically an iterative process. Right. Um, but you can actually use some other type of features as well. So the diagnostic features Feature designer allows you to compute a lot of features and rank them and so on, but, but it doesn't include all the potential feature types. Uh, so what I want to do next is to use something called uh, wavelets to extract uh, features from the signals. So wavelet scattering has become quite popular in the recent times, um, and that's because um, it's a very convenient way to extract powerful and, and robust features from signal data. And, and the way the wavelet scattering works is kind of similar to CNN's convolutional neural networks, which, kind, uh, which also extract features automatically. So um, wavelets, uh, they basically take the input signal, uh, they perform the wavelet transform for the input signal, um, and then you get some wavelet coefficients, and then you take the absolute value of the wavelet coefficients. And then you repeat this process for the uh, wavelet coefficient. So you do um, further wavelet transforms. So it's kind of like this hierarchical structure where you decompose the signal um, uh, iteratively. And at each stage, you basically get uh, the wavelet coefficients, and then you can take an average of those. And you basically get wavelet coefficients from different um, kind of compositions of the signal in a way. And, and yeah, these are these are quite powerful. And I actually used this approach in the data uh, challenge and I got uh, the best results with this approach. So not using those time domain features or frequency domain features, but actually using um, these wavelet coefficients as features. Um, so it's also very uh, easy to compute. Um, but first thing that I need to do is that I need to cut my signals into fixed length. In this case, 570, uh, because the wavelet uh, transformation assumes that every signal is uh, the same length. And then I basically, here I'm just uh, merging all these uh, variables into a single uh, variable called pressure, but I do have three columns there. And again, I have the fault column here. And then I can create a wavelet filter bank. And basically, the only information that I need to provide is the signal length, which is 570 in this case, and then the sampling frequency, which was 50 kilohertz. So that creates a, a filter bank, and then I can apply this filter bank to every, um, essentially, row in my table to compute the features. So I'm using the cell phone function here to basically apply uh, this feature matrix method. So this is a method of the filter bank that I created here to compute uh, the features from uh, all these pressure signals. So let's do that. And while, while it's computing, um, what I do then is that because I actually get um, nine different kind of what we call wavelet paths, um, so I get actually a matrix of coefficients. So what I want to do is that I want to take the median of those coefficients, so to kind of squeeze it down to one. So eventually I get um, a feature matrix like this. So it's one by 66 and 66 um, times three, basically. Right. 
right. So those are my features. So they don't look like much, but they're actually quite powerful. So then what I can do is that I can uh, uh, train a model. I can divide my data set into training and testing sets. Uh, so I can do that with a CV partition function. So that gives me an object that I can basically uh, randomly pick training samples and, and testing samples from my original data set. And then I can once again use the classification learner app to train multiple models, uh, but now with the wavelet coefficient features. So let's start a new session. And in this case, uh, my input data is the training features. And then, yeah, here I have the class information. And then let's use the uh, whole dot validation because I already have the test data separated. So I can start a session. And then just let's do a quick computation with all of these models. So now we have quite a few more features. So we have uh, something like uh, 198 features that we're training the model with. <clears throat> and we're starting to see some results. So we see that uh, linear discriminant, so it was something like 87% uh, accurate with the previous features, but now it's 95%. Uh, linear SVM, 97.7, uh, so we're closing to 100% accuracy with this method. So clearly these uh, wavelet features, these are actually better. And what I could do here is that because I have quite a few features, I could actually use some ranking methods to try to you know, reduce the number of features from 198 to something like 20 features. Uh, but in the interest of time, let's let's not do that. But we actually got uh, a few models which are 100% accurate, at least with the validation data. But what I can do here is that I can take this, uh, in this case, it's a medium uh, neural network. It means that it has, you know, what we call a medium number of hidden nodes. Um, in the network, we can take this and we can export it into the MATLAB workspace, and we can do some further testing with our test data set. So here I'm just calling the predict function and passing the test data into the model. And we can plot the confusion matrix and we get the overall accuracy of about 95. So it's not quite 100%, but it's definitely an improvement from the first model that we tried. All right. So I think we're coming to the end of the presentation. So I just want to quickly um, talk about operationalizing MATLAB algorithms. So if you have a model, like a machine learning model for anomaly detection or any kind of application or AI application, you can actually deploy that in different ways. So you can deploy your applications as standalone executables, uh, that do not require any MATLAB licenses. Um, and recently we introduced something called uh, Docker containers. So you can package automatically your application into a Docker container. And Docker containers are obviously very flexible, so you can run them in the cloud and it's very easy to manage those. Um, and then if you want to integrate your applications, your MATLAB applications into external applications, uh, you can use MATLAB compiler SDK to generate different types of libraries like Java libraries or .NET DLLs. And also something quite recent is that we, you can also automatically create microservices. So basically a Docker container um, that contains your application and we automatically build the HTTP endpoint to that Docker container. So you can use it as a microservice. And then if you're targeting um, uh, embedded systems, um, then you can translate MATLAB and Simulink applications into other source code like C or C++. Uh, but the compiler workflows are mostly for, you know, deploying MATLAB functionality into cloud or servers or other computers. All right, so let's have a quick summary. Um, so you can use machine learning for different applications uh, for industrial processes and also, you know, machinery as well. So predictive maintenance, anomaly det detection and so on. 
Anomaly detection is something that companies usually start with. So it's kind of a key technique. So you can start with anomaly detection. And if you then notice that, okay, okay there are some problems with the process or machinery, you can then apply more advanced methods and maybe try to identify the actual type of fault so that you can fix the right, right problem. Um, and there are lots of productivity tools in MATLAB, uh, for example, interactive apps that you can use to uh, extract features. So I use the diagnostic feature designer uh, and then to train machine learning models, you can use classification learner or regression learner, which is another app for regression problems. But with that, uh, I think we have a couple of minutes for Q&A and I think Michelle will post a link to the um, feedback form. Uh, so we would really appreciate if you could provide some feedback. It'll just take a minute or two to fill the form. So thank you very much for doing that. But yeah, if there are any questions, uh, let me know. And you can also post the questions into the chat if you want. Let me see if there are any questions. Yeah, maybe you can just unmute yourself if you have a question or just type it into the chat. I see that Isaac is typing a question. Yeah, sorry, good, good afternoon. Go on. Just, I just have one question. The type of data that you're collecting, does it necessarily matter what type of data it is? Um, what I'm trying to say is the, the the collection sensors that you're using to collect your data from your equipment, is there a specific method that uh, can easily integrate with uh, MATLAB or you just have to download them to Excel to convert them into CVS files, only then you can use them? Right, uh, so MATLAB supports a huge amount of different types of data sources. So I was using CSV files, uh, but you can also use other types of files. You can also connect to hardware directly with MATLAB. So we have tools to uh, connect to data acquisition devices. Uh, if you're, if you have some data historians uh, like OPC servers, MATLAB connects to those. You can also connect to databases directly with MATLAB. Uh, so there's loads of, um, you know, data sources that you can use. So not just CSV files. Yeah, great question. Okay, maybe no other questions. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for attending. Um, so I hope it was useful. Uh, it was quite a, a speedy presentation because of the time, but uh, yeah, uh, I think this was recorded. So maybe you can watch the recording as well. So yeah, thank you very much for attending and uh, have a nice day.